Hello, and welcome to the No More Global Dialogue series. Before we begin, I would like to just go over some general housekeeping. First, um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording will be shared afterwards, and it will also be available on No More's YouTube channel. Also, if you have any questions for our guest speakers today, please type them in the Q&A box. We will try to address them as we go on, and we will try to address as many of them possible. Thank you so much for your cooperation, and we really hope you can enjoy today's session. My name is Pamela Sabala, and I am the CEO of the No More Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this month's No More Global Dialogue session. These webinars aim to spark a global conversation on some of the challenges and some of the progresses on preventing gender-based violence. Today, we're foc focusing on sexual violence on college and university campuses with the aim of raising awareness and inspire action to prevent it. And for this, I have a fantastic panel of experts and students uh, joining today. And without any hesitation, I'll start with our first speaker. Really excited to have Kyle Richard, Associate Director of Men's Engagement and Special Projects for It's On Us. Kyle is an advocate and a national speaker for sexual violence prevention in sports. He has been recognized by It's On Us, the Capital One Orange Bowl, the Institute for Sport and Social Justice, and media outlets like ESPN and CNN for being an active bystander and for his efforts to engage athletes and men in violence prevention. He had the privilege of receiving a letter of praise from Commissioner Roger Goodell at the 2018 It's On Us Biden Courage Awards. Kyle, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And um, I would love to start by really asking all of you in one way or another, um, what motivated you to really um, become involved in efforts around the prevention and awareness uh, to combat sexual violence on campus? Absolutely. So coming from the sports world, I was a linebacker in college and I really wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach. That was what I really wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, I was at a party and, you know, trigger warning, um, you know, throughout, but I was at a party and, you know, we really wanted to be an active bystander in a situation with my friends um, at, at just trying to do the right thing. Somebody was trying to take advantage of somebody, um, in our opinion, and, it, you know, it, it was clear as day to us. Um, and I was able I was able to step in the situation and confront the individual, which did end up leaving me a survivor of gun violence. Um, and throughout that journey of, of recovering from the gun violence and and getting back on the football field and being a captain, being a leader like I plan to be, um, my story started getting out there. People started reaching out to me, um, including a, a domestic violence agency upstate of New York called the Kristen's Fund, who, who, you know, had my story and they wanted to give me the next generation award. Um, and this was all going on. And I, for the first time, I actually saw a video um, at, a con at that gala, at that, at that award ceremony. And they said, Kyle, you don't have to say anything. You can say something if you want. And I was like, you know, I probably won't say something because I was just trying to do the right thing with my friends. Um, but after I saw a video of, of this incident um, with Kristen involved and um, in, in crying there with my brothers and my mom around, and I, I was a guy that never cried. Like I tried to to make sure I never cried. And um, cause I, I was a man, right? Like quote, quote unquote, like I'm not supposed to, um, domestic violence, it really struck a chord with me. And I went on stage and I, I said, like, how do you call yourself a man if you're doing something like this? Right. And I just went on a rant. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was just, again, I was a kinesiology kid. Um, but people came up to me afterwards and they started saying, you got to keep on doing this, keep on talking about it. Um, and ever since then I, I was able to get in touch with activists like Brenda Tracy and people across the country that, said that hey you are part of this you can be a part of this um even in me too when i you know when i didn't really see myself as somebody that could be a part of it it really did seem more feminist leaning and um you know and we understood what it was good for but as a, as a man i didn't know my role but i started finding my role was 
hey, let's talk about relationships. Like, let's talk about love. Let's talk about the good things that we could get men involved with to prevent and prevent, you know, prevent further violence. Um, so that's that's kind of how I got started up. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was I was thrown into the field. Like a lot of people, a lot of people, especially the students we have on this panel, do a lot of work to get in the position that that I've been able to be in and my, have my platform. Um, so at least, you know, since I have a platform, I'm trying to use it the best of my advantage um, and actually be able to use the sports world, especially um, to, to activate as many men in this movement as possible. And I mean, it's fascinating um, because not only came your experience, but then actually trying to find what was your place and trying to influence that work. And I wondered what challenges you had uh, to not only to find your voice, but also to start doing that work especially as you said, right, in a space that is considered feminist or, um, you know, that where, where men haven't had that kind of leading role. Yeah, my biggest was, you know, there are so many different places within the violence prevention movement. I mean, you have the survivor support side, you have the policy side, you have the prevention side. And I, I came from active bystander, right? It's just so many different pieces to the puzzle. Um, and my head coach would always say, like, every piece of the car is important. Right. And, and, you know, I didn't know since I was an active bystander, but obviously who wants to be like me? I got, I had to take, take two bullets. And, and that's a really scary place for it in a lot of situations. And there are better ways to intervene, which I was able to kind of hit on in the beginning. Like, Hey guys, like I was running on pure emotion. Like I'm a confrontational guy and, and that's what happened to me, but there was a better, better things that we could do to be safe when we're intervening and by delegating and this and the third. Um, so I came from the active bystander world, but I knew that wasn't enough. I knew that was not, that's not real prevention. Like if, if, you know, if you want to include active bystander prevention, maybe having those conversations in the locker room, what are we saying? What are we talking about? Uh, when we're, when we're talking about women or sex or relationships, how are we talking about it? Are we talking about it in a productive way? And I'm not saying don't crack a joke every now and then to, because it's just what it is, but are we actually talking, do we know what's right and what's wrong? Are we doing that? Are we educated on these subjects? Um, so I, I started realizing, you know, I need to kind of dig a little deeper and talk to more activists and learn more and, and kind of shut up and, and take a step back and listen uh, to people that, that have been doing, you know, more prevention. And I started getting in touch with, you know, Don McPherson's of the world, which are really related yeah. to masculinity and manhood. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I realized, like, even though I'm only 26 now and, and I'm still trying to learn what it means to be a man at that point, I could at least be vulnerable with everybody and say, hey, here are my struggles. Like, here's my tr struggles with, with, you know, maybe hypersexuality. And and here's what I've dealt with in my life as a man when I deal with rejection and, and feeling unworthy or not dealing with my mental health and just, just like, just trudging away as if I don't matter. Because, hey, one part of my story is after the shooting, like, and everything that happened to me, nobody was asking me how I felt. I was probably pushing them away saying I feel fine and I'm fine. And my teammates felt the same way. Like, oh, how are you doing? I'm always good. I'm always good. But I was able to kind of realize you know, that's not, that's not being a leader and that's not really being a man is, is being standoffish. Cause I know a lot of people probably wanted to help me out and I, I was probably pushing them away. So um, there were a lot of things that kind of made me twist and turn my, my role here and my lane here. Um, but most of all, I do want to support survivors. I did take on a job at one point working directly with survivors, but I started to realize that's not where I'm best fit. And, but we do need survivor support. That is a solid team of people that we need, but I'm better fitting in prevention and getting into these conversations and talking to the sports world and talking to athletes and men about things that they want to talk about. They do want to talk about relationships. They want to talk about love and sex. We just have to lead with that in marketing wise and branding wise. But, you know, I, I know it's for, for further down the conversation, um, but I had to find my role. It was, I wanted, I am supporting survivors by prevention, by using prevention. Um, a lot of survivors I know don't want it to happen to others. And that's the way I could kind of lead and support mm -hmm. survivors, you know, is, is through that prevention way. It it takes guts to do that. It takes guts to figuring out what you're best and following that trail. Um, so, you know, I mean, congrats for that. We love the work that It's On Us does. Um, at, at Don't worry, you know, we're, we're great fans. And, and I feel this kind of sisterhood. Um, I know, I mean, you guys are great at doing reports, and I know that last week you released a new survey. Um, they're always very illuminating. Tell us what what were the findings in this one, so we know. What can we learn? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a three-part series going on, and um, if you go to itsonus.org and, and you're looking at those, those you know, educational tools, those research tools, 
Um, you'll see that we've done athletics work, but we recently released our Engaging Men's Part 2 report, which was a quantitative study. So if you look at the men's athletics, the, uh, you know, re, um, I'm sorry, prevention is a team sport report. That's all qualitative stuff. It gets real deep into what, what the athletes were talking to me about. And I could really speak to to that one specifically. But the the latest one, the latest research that just dropped and something that really relates to me and what we're doing is it's similar to a conversation that I was talking about in the locker room. Like, do they have the education around these topics to be talking about this in a positive way? Um, even if, again, if they're joking around, do they know what's right and what's wrong? Are there are there issues in, in terms of education, lapses of education? With this research study, less than 50% of these of these men in general, not just athletes. I know there was an oversample of 17% of athletes in the, in, the, in this and an oversample of people, people of color, uh, men of color in this in this um, report. But it was around 45% that said um, that they did not receive a sex ed. And then even less than that is a consent training. So there, so there are, there's a percentage of people that are learning about sex ed, but they're learning about STDs. They're learning about pregnancy. They're not talking about what consent is. They're not talking about flirting with girls or guys. They're not talking about like the, the moments leading up to, to sex or non-sex, what, what it means to take an L and how to handle rejection. Nobody's learning about this, not nobody, but it's a really small percentage and you have to treat it, especially at the college level. You have to treat it like nobody learned because even if you did receive a, a, a sex ed, are you remembering certain things? Are you remembering? Are you remembering certain pieces? Was it efficient? Was it good? Or was it modules? Right? What What did it look like? So, um, that was the 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 biggest piece is because when we're talking about prevention, and if you're a person in that prevention side of things, that's something to think about. We have to start from zero. Let's talk about sex and relationships. What's healthy? What's not? Right? Because they have not gotten that education yet. More likely than not, and you have to assume that they haven't. I I agree with you that uh you know. A lot of the conversation openers, apart from those things that obviously we didn't all learn um, and the standards of learning and all of that, you know, varies, is this just a more open conversation around what you mentioned before, love and relationships and how to date with really then shows us, you know, how to have a healthy relationship, which, you know, if you haven't even covered the basics of consent, definitely you have not arrived here. So, I mean... Apart from those topics or in those topics, how do you feel that we can open this conversation with men a bit more? Like, you know, what are the interests really? Oh, these guys want to talk about all of this in terms of what we, so what we have to start thinking about in my eyes, especially since I've been able to pilot new stuff, which we haven't been able to launch yet with, with male athletes specifically and, and men across is, is they want to talk about sex relationships. They want to talk about how to be a better at in their relationships and sex, like there's this field is yes, it's the sexual violence field and domestic violence field. Those are strong, those are strong terms, strong language, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't, they know they don't want to be that. Nobody wants to be that, right? Are they educated enough to even know that? That's so far down the line. On the other side of all the violence, and we're talking about violence and accusations and allegations, really hard things to talk about. Yes, we have to get to that, but how do you open the door for them? Let's get down to what they like to talk about which is really healthy love, really healthy relationships, really healthy sex, making sure that they understand what consent is. And nobody, like, nobody wants to take an L, but it's going to happen. You guys are going to get rejected sometimes. What do you do in those situations? Because we're not going to act like that doesn't hurt, right? We're not going to act like breakups don't hurt, okay? And it, so these breakups, these guys could fail. Some of these people could fail three tests in a row, and they're fine. But then all of a sudden, they get into a breakup, and their life is just, oh, my goodness. It's one of the worst things that could happen in, in any person's life, especially a young man's life. Um, so we have to be able to talk about those things because they want to talk about that. Now, when they they've gotten educated at some point, what how have they learned about sex specifically? That's a question that I would lead every focus group with in the in the second part of the three part series. Was asking them, hey, you know, how old were you when you learned about sex, and how did you learn about sex? It sounds crazy. I know you're definitely thinking this, but I have some crazy answers, Kyle, because you damn sure are true. It's true. Okay. These people are talking about, they learn from magazines, this and that. And I'm like, you guys were born in 2004. How are you guys still seeing porno mags? Like, what is that about? We have to be honest with this field. It's not just a sexual violence prevention field and domestic violence prevention field. We are a sex field. We are a relationship field, right? And we could actually leave with that in order to get in front of these men, bring them into the conversation. Then we were able to talk to them about the harder things like survivor support when a survivor comes to you or if you are a survivor i don't remember leaving a focus group on the, with especially with the male athletes where somebody hasn't alluded to the fact that they have been hurt physically by their partner that happens to be female 
right? So you have to start showing them, hey, you guys could be a part, you guys are actually not, you guys are more likely to be survivors than you are a perpetrator, right? These are ways to bring them in instead of pointing the finger at them, bad, bad, bad. My coach used to always say, don't think of a duck, don't think of a duck. And then everybody's thinking about a duck, right? That's not coaching, right? If you're trying to coach these people and educate them, you got to say, think of a chicken, think of a chicken. If you want them to think of a chicken, they're going to think of a chicken. But if you tell them, don't, 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 that's not actionable enough. You need to give these people action. And I was, I fall victim to it too in my prevention efforts. When I was doing speaking engagements and telling my story, my story's great. It's emotional and people love it and they get attached to it. And I could talk about my problems as a man, but what happens after I tell that story? Is there any actionables? Is this is the school? I would have to rely on the school to hopefully they do a good job of their programming on on campus because they're the hey the people are attached but now what? We have to make sure that we're opening the door and and giving them the actions the the how tos how to flirt how to talk in the DMs right things like that and then when it when they're not responding to you how to go okay I don't want to be a stalker here am I allowed to send a third text what should I do if I am going to those very real situations where a lot of our fields speak some these things in black and white. But that gray area is really important for us to talk about, especially with the men. No, I think I, I, I completely agree with you. As a sector, as a field, we failed to talk to men initially. And when we started doing some of that, we were definitely treating men as potential perpetrators, um, not just as, you know, um, fulfilling men's aspiration, needs, um, et cetera, which I guess is a great start. So... Thank you, Kyle, so much. We'll, I mean, we can be talking, I'm sure, for ages, but we'll kind of come back at the very end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, and now I am, you know, honored to introduce to you um, Sulakshi Ramamurthy. Um, she's a student at American University, um, a junior, um, studying international relations. So I love you, sisters. I did that too. Um, and she recently has started a No More chapter at American University, along with her co-president, Claire Komensberger. Um, With a profound commitment to social justice, uh, Sulakshi is deeply passionate about ending domestic violence and sexual assault. Her dedication to these critical causes drives her work towards creating a campus that is free from violence and fear. Uh, through No More, Sulakshi aims to be a catalyst for cultural change and how sexual assault and domestic violence are perceived. So, Lakshi, it's a pleasure to have you. And um, and again, we're going to start from that kind of similar point that we did with Kyle. What yeah. motivated you to become involved of, of so many issues that are discussed um, in college campuses today? What was what drove you to um, to this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my motivation um, to get involved in survivor advocacy comes from a really um, personal place of me being a survivor myself. Um, I grew up in a very violent household and I witnessed my parents be, be in a very violent relationship and seeing the toll that it took on my mom being in that relationship and coming out of that. Um, I just wanted to make sure nobody ever had to go through that again and had to go through a go through that without having the resources that they need because my mom was left with nothing and she had to build her life back up from scratch. And um, yeah, that's why I'm really passionate about putting an end to domestic violence. But I got involved in efforts to promote awareness and combat sexual violence because I witnessed the firsthand impact of sexual violence on college campuses especially at AU, and I began to notice how prevalent it was, especially my freshman year. Um, I saw that survivors were struggling to um, come out and speak about their experiences, either due to the fear of not being believed or being judged or um, being treated differently because of their experiences or just being ignored and not acknowledged for their experience. And it, it broke my heart to see the suffering and the silence of survivors. Um, and for this reason, I decided to start a No More chapter um, because I felt the responsibility to take action and to create a safer environment for students and a community for survivors where they feel safe. And um, I really believe that education and awareness are keys to preventing sexual assault. Um, but more than that, my main goal is to just change the culture of how sexual assault and domestic violence are viewed on campus because I think that's our biggest problem at AU. First, um, I mean, thank you so much for sharing your uh, personal experience. Um, um, we forget too many times of uh, uh, 
people who have witnessed domestic violence as children and you know there are so many out there and it resonates with many many of us um so thank you for that and i i really want to kind of get even a little bit more your perspective and why do you think that this has been happening on campus and why is it that we're seeing it more now um is it just because it's happening more because you get a sensation that maybe people are speaking up a little bit and yeah. really this um, and, and just to end that it's just a little bit we've seen more voices as both of you uh uh um putting nathan today also having more student activism around this topic so why do you feel this also has come around yeah um so I think this has always been that something that something that's really talked about at AAU, but there was a certain incident that really like created the influx in student activism. Trigger warning. Um, last fall in 2022, in November, um, there was a sexual assault that happened at 2 a.m. Someone broke into two girls' rooms, and um, this is kind of what triggered the entire movement at AU. Um, everyone was beyond infuriated because um, AU's administration just did not do anything to investigate the situation or, um, like, take safety protocols until like students really went out there and started like protesting against it. Um, 10 days after that incident, um, over 500 students um, participated in a walkout to protest AU's administration um, for insufficient action um, on addressing sexual assaults on campus. Um, the walkout really shed light on like AU's um, Title IX office and the failure of it um, to define Title IX. Um, a Title IX office in a school is just a department that's responsible for ensuring compliance of Title IX, which is a federal law that prohibits um, discrimination on the basis of sex in educational um, settings. And the Title IX office is um, dedicated to addressing issues related to gender-based discrimination, harassment, and um, sexual misconduct that happens on campus. Um, so from this whole situation, we began to notice the failure of the Title IX office. Um, so many students would go to the Title IX office in hopes of receiving their justice, in hopes of receiving accommodation and um, support, but instead they were just not responded to or ghosted by the office and not properly informed of what their rights are or like given the resources that they need. And just all of those incidents just kind of piled up and students were just kind of done with it and started to take things into their own hands and were like, we're going to make the change ourselves if the administration's not going to help us. So that's kind of what started the movement on campus. But yeah. Um, it's it's incredible that sometimes it's incidents like this that really, you know, um, bring it some, um, it's sad, um, but sometimes yeah. it can be the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about um, what are what is your team planning to do with the No More chapter at American? Yeah, for sure. Um, so at American, um, our we are me and mine and Claire's vision. We're just really um dedicated to implementing comprehensive initiatives to support survivors. Um, one of our key um priorities includes expanding expanding the reach of our awareness campaigns and hosting like educational workshops to ensure. Um, that they reach a broader audience at AU and to educate the student body. Um, one thing that I've noticed at AU is that students don't really know their rights and don't really know what Title IX is or where to go for resources on campus or off campus in the DC area. So that's something that we also, um, we made a resource guide actually, it's, I can share the link later, but we made a resource guide um, of um, resources on campus and off campus. Um, and we're also currently organizing a red zone campaign. Um, so the month of like September is known as red zone because it's when the sexual assault rates on college campuses are the highest, especially with incoming freshmen. Um, so we are printing 2000 door hangers that explain what red zone is and we're putting a QR code on it with resources and we're gonna hang it on every dorm door on campus, which we're currently working on right now and we're super excited about it. Um, but also another thing is it's really um, easy for survivors, especially in college, to feel lonely and to feel like that they don't have anybody there for them. So we also want to host like self-care events and art events and movie nights to just create a community and show people that they have a community that they can lean back on and feel safe with. And 
yeah, ultimately our goal is just to create a survivor-centered campus where every member um, of our community knows that they have the support that they need to heal and can um, take the steps that they need to seek their justice. Do you feel that when, uh, especially around sexual misconduct, um, mm -hmm. do you feel that many people maybe are coming into campus just with some of these, um, I mean, like it's normal that some of some bits happen and so they don't call them off or they don't know that the support is there um, and they probably minimize it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think especially in college, this is like, a topic that's not really like talked about. It's very stigmatized. Um, I think that um, it's really important for students to come out and talk about this. And it has been, it, it has come to a point where it's been normalized. Like mm -hmm. if like someone touches you, like grabs you, like it seems like a normal thing, like at a party, but that's someone violated you and people like normalize that as normal behavior, but it's not. And that's why, that's one of my main goals to educate people that that's wrong and you should call people out on it um and you have people here to support you and i think yeah i think it's definitely normalizing college and that's a culture change that we hope to achieve at au by educating our student body thank you so much uh for talking to us and um yeah. i will carry on then asking you know uh a bit more questions but thank you so much for being uh, obviously with us today. So let me move to Sarah, Sarah, who's a project manager at the University of Colorado. Um, and Sarah's why is her personal mission statement and is to be a source of compassion for herself, which Sarah, I, you know, we, we so are no compassionate about ourselves so many times. Um, it's scary. And her community. She's a devoted dog mom, a daughter, a sister, a survivor, and a seeker of justice. Sarah has experience in uh, violence prevention across private and public sectors, non-for-profit management, systems development, and earned a master's in public administration um, in, and gender violence from the University of Colorado. For the past few years, Sarah has been working in health equity, state policy to fund and foster trauma-informed systems, and one day, create a world without violence. We are united in that effort, um, Sarah. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I, again, I would love to ask you what motivated you um, to get involved and, and, you know, and fight for this kind of, you know, mission. Thank you so much, Pamela. And I'm really honored to be here on this panel with such incredible other change makers in our community. Wow, what a privilege. Um, so as you might have seen, my core purpose is actually really tied to fostering a world without violence. Um, this comes from being a third generation survivor of gender-based violence and the opportunity to connect with really countless other survivors, connect with them, cry with them, share a lived experience. Um, so I'm really here because I'm motivated by the collective tragedy that unfortunately is pervasive in our communities around my experience, my family's experiences, and a lot of friends that also have lived experience with sexual violence. Um, so trigger warning, I'm going to share a bit about my experience. If you'd prefer to uh, mute me until another panelist is up, feel free. Um, you know, I grew up in a really privileged environment in a suburb of Arizona, but when I was 16, I wound up in a very abusive relationship. It was abusive physically, emotionally, verbally, sexually, and really just frankly dampened my light as an individual, as someone who has always been justice oriented and obsessed with Law and Order SVU and Olivia Benson, regardless of my own lived experience. Um, and I didn't tell anyone in my life for years that this happened, you know, and to Kyle's point earlier, I think this speaks about the need for consent and healthy education training earlier. We don't need to start when we're 18. Let's start earlier. Let's teach each other how to have consent over sharing crayons before we even have to make it intimate, you know, because that's a whole other complicated situation. Um, and then unfortunately, during my freshman year of college, I was assaulted again at a uh, university, uh, excuse me, at, at my university on campus at a fraternity party. Um, and this is really when I want to say it was almost a wake up call for me because I started to share my story. I told people around me what happened and what was really still happening for me, because even though it occurs in one space, you know, I developed PTSD and that was impacting me on a daily basis with 
how I was able to show up to class, which spoiler alert was not very often, you know, and the fear of having to see someone on campus that I'd had a uh, violent experience with and, and not understanding what to do with that. And, um, you know, like Shalakshi was saying, trying to understand if what happened was assault, was it right? Was it wrong? Even as someone who had been reading these books and literature for years, wasn't able to contextualize my own experience of assault in its definition and in its true form. Um, and when I really started to share my story, honestly, eight out of 10 people that I was sharing it with were saying, me too. Shout out to Toronto Burke there. And that just pissed me off. I was furious. And I was mad because not just because it happened to all of us, but because so many of us felt the need to stay silent. Um, and it took a while, but I began to understand that while my story is uniquely mine, it really belongs to all of us. Um, because this is really where I became committed to join this unofficial but very ragtag powerful group of bad ASS feminists that are around this world that are all on this call right now saying that we're kind of done. We're not going to return to that place of silence and isolation for survivors of violence. Um, and so really the short answer is I want to foster a community where survivors can bear their scars in the light of day, paint them in glitter, and we can all work together, standing arm in arm on lifting each other up for a different type of culture. Um, you know, I have my master's in public administration and gender-based violence, which was really, really critical for me in understanding how systems and institutions play into the perpetuation of violence. And ooh, if I was mad with talking to individuals, I got even more mad when I learned about all the <laughs> stuff that is keeping it this way that's happening in our society and institutions and policies, not just in the US, but all around, you know? And so for the past few years, I've been really fascinated in how our culture, our economic systems, our political institutions really uphold and perpetuate rape and gender violence. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, I mean, one of the pieces that I pick up um, for any parent that is hearing us um, um, or any adult, in all of matter of fact, is there seems uh, to me that there is a lack of awareness on teen dating violence and how, you know, at 15, 14, 16, you can have, you know, very complicated uh, relationships, abusive in all forms. And I think um, um, it's, um, and also you kind of also touch on uh, generational violence and the impact that that has. Um, not necessarily on costing um, uh, the next generation for that to happen to them, but all the traumas associated with them, how that comes, you know, how come that comes down. So I think those are topics that we we tend to forget a lot. But can you tell us a little bit about um, prevalence on sexual violence in campus and, and tell us for everybody that doesn't know what a red zone is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you probably heard the statistics by now, but the data, which we'll talk about why it's maybe not um, accurate of lived experience of everyone around us, says one in five women, one in 13 men, and one in four trans or gender nonconforming students. And I would also probably include the LGBTQ population in that one in four from my personal anecdotal experiences, um, experience sexual assaults at some point during college. You know, and as I said earlier, you know, based on my personal experience and yes, like attracts like in terms of like-minded people, but I experience over 50% of my communities as a survivor of some sort of sexual violence or even harassment in some way. And I, so I believe that number is higher. Um, you know, the reason that I think we have some of those discrepancies in reporting and what we're seeing on campus and how we're able to really measure prevalence, again, speaks to, you know, Kevin's point around how, or Kyle, excuse me, I'm so sorry, Kyle's point um, around education. Because, you know, we, we've seen in research, when you're asking a question that says, have you ever raped somebody? 14%, about 14% of men and perpetrators say, yes, they have. If you ask the question, have you ever forced someone to have sexual intercourse? That number goes up to 34%. Same experience, we're just using different words. And so kind of like, you know, uh, Kyle was saying, if we move away from the labels and move more into educating on what the experience looks like and the realistic pathways we can take out of that when those situations do arise, that's where we're able to kind of connect to those real prevalence numbers. Um, and then the red zone is, you know, also mentioned um, by Shulas Shulaski was 
it's a term that's been kind of floating around in literature since the early 2000s. Um, it's unfortunately named for a football reference, but I digress. Um, <laughs> It speaks to the con the period of time at the beginning of the school year. Typically, it's focused around freshman students, but no one is immune because you don't wear your um, grade on your T-shirt uh, when you're walking around on campus. But freshmen are most likely or most at risk for experiencing sexual violence. That is over 50% of college sexual assaults that we see that we're able to track, which means there's more, um, are happening in August, September, October, November, up to Thanksgiving break, typically. So this is, this sucks, right? And this is also, I think, an opportunity for us to look at when we understand prevalence, when we have this privilege of data that we've only really had for the past 40 years, um, and 40 years is being generous in this industry, is you hear the words at risk a lot. I just want to name for any single survivor that's listening, please make sure that at risk is never translated or interpreted as your fault. Just because we understand there are higher risks and higher times by certain activities and behaviors, and if you go to a party and you decide to drink alcohol, you are not responsible for violence that you experience. The only person responsible is the person that chooses to commit violence. So take prevalence um, and prevention statistics with that kind of grain and make sure that you're um, acknowledging that, you know, use common sense, look out, but remember the only person that's ever responsible is the person who commits it. Doesn't matter if you're incapacitated, doesn't matter if it's the red zone. But now that we do have this information, let's do something with it. Let's do um, outreach and awareness events so we can try to just have a little bit more awareness to start you know, opening that conversation for folks that Kyle and It's On Us are talking to and saying, hey, let's have these conversations. It's hard to bring up those conversations without them feeling intense. But if you have a bunch of red flags that are all over campus or red door hangers that are bringing awareness to something, you can say, hey, this week at the you know fraternity, the business fraternity meeting, we're just going to have a topic about some things that are going on on campus. We're seeing these red flags. Does anyone know what they mean? They want to talk about it. Just little mm -hmm. ways to kind of start that conversation. And I I guess that's, and that, that's a lot of what sometimes students do. But what are the challenges? Let's talk a little bit more. Sometimes we don't talk enough. Some of the challenges that the administration of the universities are actually facing. Is it only that they're not doing things right? Or are there like real challenges that we can perceive in terms of, we you know, what's not happening? There's deep structural challenges. Unfortunately, it's not a lack of people with good intentions and desires to make our world a safer place. I think that's a value um, that most people would agree with and wouldn't fight against. I think what the issue is, is you have two different main actors. One actor is a university who frankly is a business and even mm -hmm. public universities, their job is to make money and stay open so they can keep educating students. So that's always going to be their primary goal. The other actor is this global movement to end sexual and domestic violence and gender violence, a movement that is happening all over in different ways. And so there isn't one, the same organization of very, very, very clear priorities between these two actors. And two, even when we do organize and have really clear priorities, they're going to be fundamentally contradictory to what a university has to prioritize. So there's, that's kind of the overarching thing that you know, people that are well-meaning and want to make change within their university could hit red tape that even the chancellor would like to remove, but feels like their hands are tied because of bureaucracy and red tape and things like that. Um, you know, I think the other challenge is underfunding. We have just no money for this stuff. Um, and that kind of ties back into that prevalence issue. It's a little bit of a catch-22. We're not seeing real numbers. If you don't see real numbers, our nonprofit sectors and private foundations and government funding is set up to respond to numbers and data. And so we don't have the numbers that we know are there um, to really show what this epidemic looks like and what the impact is. You know, we're still growing our research base of what it looks like when PTSD is experienced by the majority of people for 20 years and how that impacts society. How does that impact their mental health outcomes? How many trips are taking to the emergency room? Who is being incarcerated? Um, and then I would also say they're facing an issue of policy. You know, we have a ton of universities that are still trying to recover from a Betsy DeVos era Department of Education Title IX recommendations and requirements, which I'm guessing most folks on this call are aware were extremely and horrendously harmful to survivors. There was guidelines saying that uh, respondents, which is the university word for the accused, um, are able to have their father or friends or fraternity brothers question the accuser 
and the person, the complainant. Um, and that's absurd. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So I think having universities now, luckily those, the most heinous of those have been repealed and they have new department of education standards they're working on in title nine. But again, underfunding, having to means that there's probably only one person on most campuses who's really responsible for title nine policy. That's like one person out of a school of 30,000. And so they can do the best they can, but it's going to take two years to develop new uh, structures to support good Title IX practices that are gender inclusive and have a wide definition of what sexual assault and rape is and also is able to connect you to support services and resources and maybe help organize a red flag um, campaign or door knocker on campus, you know, all these different pieces tie into each other and all support rape culture, regardless of anyone's intent or desire. No, thank you for that. I, one of the things that we always struggle with is exactly the point around data and the way that we have been used to collating data. And that really affects the prevention space in general, um, right? Because it's, um, it's harder to prove, right? Um, you know, compared to how many nights in the shelter you spent to how many people see a campaign and will actually be impacted by it. Um, so it's it's an interesting a problem that we're just not set to deal with prevention in a faithful way, um, like we did with education a hundred years ago, right? Where literacy became, if we all read and write, we'll just become better set. Um, we need that kind of inspiration um, to come our way. So thank you so much, Sarah. And, and we'll kind of join back. Um, and our kind of final speaker um, is uh, Nathan Tom. He's a student from the University of Massachusetts. And uh, he um, is also um, uh, started Delta Sigma Phi says no more. So we're um, truly excited. Um, Nathan, as I said, is a founding member, which um, of not an ordinary fraternity, they are uh, there to create positive change. Um, they value personal development, community engagement, and lifelong connections. Uh, but what sets them truly aside is their commitment to be the first fraternity to join the No More movement. They're standing up against domestic and sexual violence on campus striving to create a safer college experience for everyone. And um, Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I remember those initial conversations where you guys were um, setting up the chapter. Um, what motivated you personally really to come in and really be a champion for this project in campus? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel. And uh, I'm gonna try to do my best to follow up after these prior amazing panelists too. But as you can see, um, I started this fraternity my freshman year and we did not want to be the ordinary frat. We wanted to be able to make positive change and develop people into um, people who have amazing character. But I guess my personal call to action was that, um, also trigger warning now, sophomore year of college, um, there was widespread protests of a fraternity on campus. You may see on the news, but um, there was a fraternity that was accused of sexually assaulting one of the guests. Um, within days of this news spreading, um, there was a public outcry for justice. They wanted the school to do something, and they wanted the fraternity to do something as well. But after around a week or so of the outcry, there was no response from either sides. Um, just like Sarah was saying, the administration and the institutions that are involved in these are not efficient enough to be able to help these survivors. But students felt like they were effectively being um, stonewalled, basically. So that's when the students took action and they decided over a thousand people went outside of the fraternity house, decided to protest. Um, the crowd felt so strongly that even the riot police had to come to disperse the crowd. But in this particular instance, it really made me think that the school was not doing what they should have been doing. They're not protecting their students, um, as well as the fraternity was not protecting their guests. Um, and I come from a family that 
I was raised by, by many strong women. Um, shout out my mom, who's in the crowd. But I thought to myself after this, how can I make a change? How can I make a difference? So that's where our goal of really educating specifically men and specifically Greek life about ways to prevent these outcomes and ways to help survivors come forward and feel safe enough to try to get their justice. Um, so what we want to do is basically make our campus a safer place for everyone. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that's where my journey in No More started. Now, um, thanks for that. And a big shout out to mom. Um, wherever you're hearing us in the crowd, um, we're so impressed. Uh, with the work that Nathan and his colleagues of the fraternity have have done, so we've been really inspired. So, um, you know that talks a lot. Um, but um, how do you kind of come to the idea, Nathan, with uh the fraternity really that having a campaign to raise awareness was important? Like, you know, how how did that calling came and and you kind of all made the decision that you were going to try to do this? Well, yeah, so after those events, um, we knew that taking this step forward as a fraternity to advocate for this problem was going to be something that's kind of challenging. You know, we are an organization of 100% men when these problems are happening to majority women, heavy majority women. Um, people might ask, like, how do we even know about these problems? How can we relate to these experiences? But we're here to recognize that there is a rift in perspectives. We're trying to close it. Uh, we know that men do need to be a part of the solution. And um, we just yeah. want to be able to get over that that stigma, I guess. Um, we want to start the dialogue here between the students, administration, and Greek life to be open and provide a space that survivors can feel safe that even party goers can feel safe and they know that they're not going to be harmed so Lisa, i think that oh sorry. sorry i just wanted to kind of ask you that like were there some practical challenges right as like as soon oh. as you kind of go out like you know what was the reaction um yes like tell us what were some of those immediate real challenges that you know um you guys faced Definitely. Like when I, um, one of our first events we did for No More was a, a hot cocoa fundraiser, getting people to sign the pledge and um, just be more familiar with No More and their cause. But we uh, first had to approach a sorority. I felt like uh, being a fraternity, we needed to have women's perspective on our side as well. And we can't just be speaking from the perspective of men. So we tried to organize a joint event, but um, with this sort of, we weren't a chapter, a fully a chapter of No More at this point. Um, but since we weren't a fully a chapter and we weren't like completely affiliated, it was not, the sororities nationals were not very fully confident in the outcome of this uh, event. They thought that maybe it'd start conversations that would make them look bad or make our fraternity look bad. But we just know that what we were doing was a good cause. And ultimately, we're still making our campus a safer place. So we were still worried about the repercussions. But um, I think it was important that we pushed through and really made a statement so that other fraternities and other sororities can follow in our footsteps. And, and what advice would you give other fraternities that are thinking about this or that might, you know, start a process? Um. Well, basically, you just got to start. Uh, might seem like a daunting challenge we're all facing. And that also might be true. I'm not naive enough to think that by the time I graduate from UMass, this problem is going to be solved. I know that right now we need to create a base for the problem to be solved and that's still going to be hard work but you can't be scared of the challenge um we need to join together for a common goal uh, i mean like our chapter felt so strongly about joining the cause because of no more's values and 
how they align with ours. So that was not a tough decision to make to join the cause or effort. But I think that the fraternities need to look deeper into what they stand for and how they can help. Thank you so much for that, uh, Nathan. Um, it's, um, it's, as I said, it was a pleasure kind of working uh, with you from the start and, and thank you for being here. So now if we can kind of all kind of come together really and we've had so many questions um, and we don't have the time, um, but I'm gonna try to, you know, merge and, and bring them together. I'm gonna start with Kyle. There, there is there are many questions around what can sports really do to come into this provincial culture and really influence it. So in a way, how 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 can sports be an ally? Yeah, there's a couple of ways for sure. I mean, first off, um, there are many, many university people percentage wise that are athletes as in certain universities that that percentage is even higher um, than others. Um, we want to be able to make sure we're, we're preventing as much violence as possible. And we have guidelines and I know there are systems in place for, um, you know, universities to get prevention out there. Um, unfortunately, a lot of universities take the easy way out, which is click through modules that nobody's building culture around. The good thing about athletics and sports, at least for the prevention and athletes, and especially in Greek life as well, this also plays a factor, is there are so many people together in one room that you could actually engage with in terms of prevention efforts. And yes, there are it's mandated. They're going to have to be there, right? But if you give them something and give us something, right, speaking as a former athlete, that's really good. It, that hour or two flies by and it's like nothing. And we actually get something from it. It's that when we feel like we're forced to go somewhere after a problem happened, after a high profile incident happens, right? And then you're in there, then it looks like you're part of the problem. You're a perpetrator. Here's the why. And here's your title line thing. That's that's where it becomes a, it becomes a problem. But at least you know you can you have to educate those those demographics um, on campus. Another thing is, yeah, you have to use influence. And you know the biggest piece for me when I was a student, um, when I because all this happened, my story happened, and I, my ESPN Sports Center special ha happened when I was a senior. But that all, that whole story was when I was a junior, um, going into my going into my junior season, I should say. And what I was able to do, I you know, athletes in general just have time constraints. It's hard to get athletes to do, you know, a lot of things outside because they're always traveling, practicing, school, this, that, the third. Um, you know, I even missed the Thanksgiving playing football. Like, the time constraints are there. But what I was able to do for our, our local safer organization or like a No More, like a It's On Us chapter – um, was promote events and and put it out there for them. I had a big platform. I was an athlete. A lot of athletes in Greek life do have big platforms for change. And if you want these people to be a part of it, maybe try to get them in a smaller way, which is being an ambassador. When if you have an event that you want to get people to, it would be a good idea to get somebody as high profile as an athlete on your campus to actually promote that idea. And hey, now that person that, that's promoting that idea is feeling like they're more of a part of the change and a part of the solution than they are a part of, as a part of the problem. Um, we do recognize sports as, especially when you're trying to engage men, as a huge chunk of the male population that you could cover by just talking about sports. It's not everybody, but it's way better than what this movement's been doing, especially as in, in terms of engaging men. And we know that sports drives culture. Taylor Swift's everywhere because Travis Kelsey's this, and I'm not going to say who is more clout or not, but we know the sports world's huge and that there's a reason why so many people are paying attention, um, including me. There are great people, student leaders that are doing the same work as me and saying, saying similar things as myself. But the reason why my, and there are people that have been hurt trying to prevent violence like myself. The reason why my story went viral and the reason why people hung on to it is because I played football. And that's just the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. I was an athlete and I did something, right? So that's that's the reason why we want to make sure we're leveraging sports is because that's the highest visibility things at university. They are the biggest representation of the universities that they are playing for and participating for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kyle and Sarah. Um, I, I think in a way we address uh, this with um, both Lakshmi and Nathan as students, but why do you think that college survivors are finding it hard really to report their assault in college and universities from, again, talking from a much more of an administration point of view or, or what are those experiences telling us? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there is very rarely trauma-informed systems set up that support survivors through that. 
And so for me, when I was post um, assault, when I was 19 and a freshman in college and knew that it was time to get help, but didn't know where to go, I did start with the university. Um, I went to my campus police and they, and I experienced them as more concerned about how many drinks I had had the night before, rather than who assaulted me or the details of the, of the physical violence that I experienced. So I did not feel supported in that conversation and my mental health was struggling. So I did not feel confident that I would be able to uh, safely move through a university adjudication process or a civil trial or criminal trial or anything like that. So the legal system, the university's version of the legal system did not feel like it was an option for me. You know, even when I went to, I was able to find a support group that was there for a little while, but even the support group was really not led with trauma-informed practices. And so even survivors that want to report and want help, it's oftentimes they can get close and get to the door and then feel that wall and they feel the experience of rape culture. And that can really feel like being re-victimized, you know, by a system rather than an individual. And so many survivors rightly so, avoid formal systems in order to protect themselves as a form of safety. Now that's, um, and those are some of the challenges that we kind of need to keep on pushing, right, to to be able to beat. Um, I mean, so actually, in terms of bystanders, right, I know that's part of the campaign. How do we move people, not only from having a knowledge, but from your experience, how from them to become you know, bystanders. We saw obviously what Kyle did, which I mean, he agrees that was like, you know, but how can we make sure that in your opinion, that we're engaging, you know, students as bystanders too, active bystanders? Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that with, we just had our first no more meeting and a lot of the people, we had so many people attend, which was amazing. Um, but a lot of the people that did come were bystanders, which is amazing. And I think that the support of bystanders is very, very important in this movement. Um, and yeah, I think just like education is where it begins and that's how that it starts with education and then everything else follows, but yeah. And Nathan, we touched a little bit with Kyle on this, but, um, it's also come up in the Q and A's and is this, you know, how do we communicate you think with young men without treating them like if they're potential perpetrators, right? How, yeah. how you know, how does that come across? And is do you feel that's hard sometimes on young men who may want to be doing the right thing, but actually are being labeled negatively? Yeah, I definitely think that's like a tough topic. I know that we have had entire meetings with all the fraternities. Um, and when people come in to speak to them and what tell show them what bystander prevention is like, um, I feel like many people aren't listening or they're not really paying attention because they feel like, oh, I already know what it's like. I already know all this like basic knowledge. They might think it's basic, but um, talking to men, I feel like we need to connect on, like Kyle said, that kind of smaller level of what's right, what's wrong. Uh, that, that gray area is really tough. Um, Obviously, you know you want to be able to help someone who's in danger, but when it comes to someone who's your friend is a perpetrator, maybe some people won't know what to do in that situation. Um, there's a lot of different situations that can arise, and we just need to know how to respond to all of them and just definitely feel out how do we approach this and how can I make people feel as safe as possible. No, that thank you for that. And I just want to ask a very quick question because we're, you know, just on time. But if you have to leave one action for anybody hearing us about something that they can do or they should do, let me start with Kyle. What would that be? You you said that question at the very worst time. I am in New York and there are ambulances just flying by. So can you just repeat that last part again? <laughs> no, I know what that is. Um just, you know, one action, a quick action that you think that anybody here should be doing regarding this topic. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, first off, let, let's reset. Like together, we all need to kind of reset, especially on the prevention side. Um, survivor support needs to keep drilling and keep doing what they're doing, the hard work that comes in survivor support. But if you're somebody that is, you know, looking into prevention and doing prevention work, 
let's not go too far. Let's take a step back and look at the what is what are the roots of this thing? What are some of those actionables that we can get across? Um, you know, we do know that there are going to be violent people out there and, and people that are that know what's right and what's wrong and and they still do some bad things. And we're not ignorant to that as well. That's why that survivor support aspect is even more, you know, in the justice side of things is, is, is very needed. However, again, that gray area, not just for active bystanders that we that we, um, Nathan just alluded, Nathan just alluded to, um, but in terms of you know when you're in a situation, a sexual situation or a romantic situation, when if you're in an argument, right? What happens then? Are you breathing? Are you taking those deep breaths when you're in an argument? Because hey, people, it's gonna happen. Are you you know what's the difference between is the, is it just toxic and not toxic relationships, or is there something in between that's a little bit unhealthy that we could work on? Some things that get us to that green area. Um, and, you know, It's On Us is always welcome to helping people start off and, and reframe the thinking behind prevention, um, starting us on us chapters out there. We have a bunch, um, you know, and ac actually athletically uh, we'll be we'll be doing work and I'd love to loop people, anybody in, in that wants to to talk about that launch. We're going to be launching something in November. Um, and yeah, so basically really, I know there are questions like, shouldn't we start this earlier? Yes, but at least for me, that's focused on the university level. We're going to keep having to attack it the way we have to, which is people at the high school level are not getting this information, and we're going to have to teach them right away with the meat and potatoes. We have to act like we're the very first people that are talking to them about sex and relationships so that it's not so that we can't just act like the like these people are learning from porn, they're learning from family, they're learning from all these other things. We want it to come from us. At least they we could teach them. And now the people that know and are educated, we're actually attacking in that regard in terms of knowledge and education, uh, like like the rest of the panel was mentioning. Um, but yeah, if in terms of trying to do better, like if you if you know you know it's on us or no more, and you're trying to do work, take a step back and realize. Hey, these people are not educated enough to even get to consent, to even get to sexual violence and domestic violence. A lot of people need to get to what is a healthy thing to do in your relationship and when you're in a, a sexual situation. Thank you so much, Kyle. And Sulakshi, that one piece of advice. Um, one piece of advice if you want to get like engaged in the effort. I know that for me it was it's very intimidating to like, you know, like start advocating for like ending sexual violence and domestic violence like I was terrified to like start a whole chapter and like lead this this semester but it's it's really nice to be able to like connect with like-minded individuals the way that I got involved with all the advocacy I was I'm a policy organizer for Know Your Nine I'm not sure if you guys know the organization but they do a lot of um, advocacy work for empowering survivors of sexual violence and that's kind of how I got involved and um my advice would be to start like reaching out to other organizations, see how you can get involved. Like there's so many organizations that do amazing work, like No More, No You're Nine, It's On Us, um, and Rape on Campus. And there's just so many organizations that you can get involved with. And I think that's, it's really important to just start like putting yourself out there, getting involved, be a part of the change. And also another piece of advice is I, it's also important to take a step back and take care of yourself because this kind of work can get very, very overwhelming and very draining. And sometimes when you're like, when you're actually doing things and making change, it still feels like you're not really doing anything because there's always so much room for improvement. But it's important to like recognize that you are making a change and you are making a difference and you should give yourself a pat on the back for everything that you're doing. But yeah. Um, definitely take care of yourself and your mental health. That's very important. But yeah, those are my two pieces of advice. No, thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. Just want to plus one to Shulaxi because um, put your own oxygen mask on first. Take care of your story, especially if you're a survivor. Take care of yourself. Um, you are the most important part of your activism. And after that, give yourself space to find a lane that feels good for you to fit in. There's so many entry points to this work, uh, you know, which Kyle was mentioning earlier. You can do prevention work and education. You could lead healthy relationship classes uh, for middle schoolers. You could teach consent uh, via crayons and how to how to ask someone to borrow a purple crayon. And if they say no, how do you go get your needs met somewhere else and find another purple crayon, you know, from someone that wants to let you borrow it? That can be done in elementary school. Um, I thought I was going to be running a sexual um, assault nonprofit at some point by this point in my career, but I found passion and purpose in healthcare policy and higher education policy and workforce because it's all tied to gender violence, right? I think anything that you feel like 
you can do, even if it's at a, your dinner table with your family or your roommates, that is moving the needle towards a world where it's just inhospitable for violence. We can't even grow it here. There's just no environment for it. That's the goal. And we can all do that, whether it's on a micro or macro scale every single day. Thank you so much for that. And you're absolutely right. It can be small or big. It's just important to push that little. And Nathan. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Sarah. I love how she said push that needle. Um, I think that even at the smallest scale, it's the easiest step to take is to start the dialogue. Um, I want people to be able to feel comfortable to talk about these things, to feel safe and to feel supported. Um, I think that there, especially in with men, there's kind of a stigma of, oh, let's kind of not talk about this. Or it's not really our problem, or maybe we don't want to face a problem. So I think that creating a culture where these kinds of situations, these kinds of problems can be talked about and really just try to resonate with your neighbor, um, make them feel like you're there for them. And if we keep all working at the micro scale, uh, our actions will compound and change into something macro. Yeah, you know, and that's what we stand for. We say, you know, only together, this is the only way to try to really combat, um, uh, you know, uh, gender-based violence. So thank course, you so much. Course. Thank you so much, um, Kyle, Sarah, Sulakshi, and Nathan for speaking and being here with us today. Um, the next No More Global Dialogue series uh, event will take place on the 18th of October in partnership with Plan International, and it will focus on digital initiatives to prevent and respond to gender-based violence in Latin America. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, for everybody. Thank you for everybody for their questions. This just keeps us excited and keep going and carrying on with this message. So thank you, everybody, from um, No More.